Uh, good afternoon. It's, uh, it's wonderful to see all of you. Um, it's wonderful to see the Beit Midrash full and to meet people from a came, who came from around the world with one purpose, um, and that is to live a more Jew, meaningful Jewish life by learning together. Uh, people who didn't look to the left and to the right and said, um, I want to learn with those people who agree with me. I want to sit with those people who agree with me. I only want to be with those people who I know for sure are going to reaffirm what I believe and what I think. But I'd like to be part of a learning process where hopefully at the end, my life as a Jew, my understanding of Judaism, will be a little deeper and a little thicker. And um, when I look at the type of Jewish world that I want to live, with, that I want to live in, if I never had to leave this Beit Midrash, life would be good. And um, so thank you for being here. Uh, this year um, is, uh, we have really a, um, I can say this as a son, but I speak for, I hope all of you, we have an honor um, uh, to study the work, the thoughts, the ideas of a man who, affected, who lived a good life. Uh, who lived a good life because he affected the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. And um, a living covenant is really what it is. Um, his work is alive, his thinking is alive, and um, while sadness, you, I don't want to say this is not a, this is not a summer of, uh, of sadness. There is sadness. Um, and that sadness is natural. Um, but it's not only sad. Um, there's something very beautiful and powerful about um, not giving recognition, but continuing to learn from and live with um, a person whose ideas shape the lives of so many in this room. Um, and uh, so many people outside of this room. And so it's, uh, it's a journey um, into, the, into the various features and, and ideas and principles that my father worked on for most of his life. Um, oh, and um, just as a side note, uh, this week crying is officially allowed, so <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's fine. Um, we're all going to do it at different points. Um, in thinking about how I should introduce um, my father's work to you, um, fortunately, we were all able to, when he was 80, celebrate uh, his birthday. And um, we did that um, by getting together and thinking about what what did he say? And what does it mean? And very often, precisely when you're in the midst or with someone who is larger than life, you don't conceptualize because it's just there. It's just standing opposite you all the time. And it, it sort of takes you over. It encompasses you. It hits you. It touches you. And as it touches you, you experience it until it touches you again. Um, but at 80, many of us began this process of stepping back and saying, what, what is this philosophy and approach to Judaism that um, I could say personally, without it, not only would I not be in the job that I'm in, but I don't know if I would be as invested in Judaism as I am. I don't know. It was a philosophy of Judaism which enabled me to feel that this is a tradition that I could love. This is a tradition that I can be a part of. What was it? What were its key features? Why were, uh, was I or so many people so touched by it? Why, how did it enable a Jewish life? And what I'd like to do um, is walk you through three things that my father taught me, which at a later point in my life, I realized were the core feature of everything that he was writing. 
And um, while he taught me all the time, these three things that he taught me stuck out. Stuck out very, very clearly. And I, have, I don't have many memories of particular things in my life. I don't know, some people remember. I know my sister Tova, who you're going to meet, she was the family historian. She remembers everything. Everything that ever happened, she, this families always have a history. Tova has a memory, Kanai Nahara, of everything. That not just happened to her, to me. Like she, I didn't even know I was there, but she has distinct, not only memories, feelings about how I felt at that. And I didn't even know if events took place. I don't have many memories. It's, like, it's just sort of like when you're ADHD, it's like sort of things become a fog. <laughs> so like I just sort of like, like I got through the year, and like no teacher killed me. It's like those were like the big things I was looking for. So there was a fog. But it's strange that there, are, there were three things that not only did he teach me, but that I remember when he taught them to me. I remember the experience of being taught them. Some I remember the exact time, two of them, literally, um, the time and the, the other one I have a, a vaguer memory which I carry with me and have carried with me my whole life. And they shaped what, the way I understand Judaism. And I think it's a very good way to introduce my father's philosophy to you. The first one um, occurred somewhere between grade two and grade three. The second one occurred in 1972, in the spring of 1972. And the third occurred in 1977. And um, I'd like to share with you each one of those ideas that he taught me. One when I was eight, one when I was 14, and one when I was 19. And as I said later on, I realized that these were the core ideas that, that, that accompanied him as he taught and as he wrote um, and as he walked uh, through the world. The first occurred in a story that I tell very often to people um, when my father asked me what I learned in school that day. Yes, you know, what did you learn in school that day? And as I tell very often, and as many of you know, in the Hartman family, what did you learn in school that day had nothing to do with math or physics or chemistry or biology. What you learned in school that day only meant what, Jewish, what did you learn in Judaism that day? What, what did you learn in Torah? And it wasn't an ideological move. It's just, you have to remember, my father failed elementary school twice. And uh, neither he nor my mother had any clue about basic math or anything in that. Like, it's just, I don't think they ever balanced a checkbook. Ever. Ever. That concept was a foreign concept to them. It was just, what do you mean by, it just wasn't part of the way. If the, it was, you just lived, you know, and, uh, and you, you managed, and sometimes you didn't. Like, I don't, I don't ever remember being able to go to my parents and getting help in a math homework. Now, the good news about that is that I could fail in math. Because nothing other than that was expected of you. No, as I, if, it, if you have a bad mark in math, what's the answer? Well, it's math. And that was okay. Like, that's okay. A human being doesn't have to know math. We don't know math, and we're doing just fine in life. Ah, but for you not to know, chumish. No. So, Danielle, what did you study? And I'm not able to recreate what I studied, but I remember what he said, so I'd like to recreate with you something that his answer to me would have been very, very appropriate. So let's study together. 
Source 1, Genesis 21, one, verse 1. The Lord took note of Sarah as he had promised. And the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken. After waiting his whole life for God to give him and Sarah a child, the moment finally occurs. Abraham gave his newborn son, whom Sarah had borne to him, the name of Isaac. And when his son Isaac was eight years old, Abraham circumcised him as God had commanded. Now Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter. Everyone who hears will laugh at me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah should suckle children? Yet I have borne a son in his old age. The child grew up and was weaned, and Abraham held a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. It's a wonderful story, a little cynical. And the truth is, Sarah has a right to be a little, little cynical. She sort of got stuck in Abraham's commitment, you know. He had God come to him and say, go forth from your father's house, from the land that you're born to the place that I will show you. And Abraham says, sure, you know, and she's on for, along for the ride. And it's kind of a wild ride, and it's, an, it's, a, it's a torturous ride, and it's a sad ride. And finally, at the end of her life, she has a child with him. But not before, the chapter earlier, she basically had given up. And she says, she says, I have no... I haven't given Abraham a child. And remember in antiquity, if you don't have children, it's always whose fault? It's always the woman's fault. You know? It's always the woman's fault. You know, she didn't fulfill her duty to her husband. So she gives her husband her handsmaid, Hagar, and says, even though it's not mine, it's still, I've given it to you. And Hagar has a child, Yishmael. And now the family is complete. And there'll be two brothers um, who will live hopefully, hopefully, happily ever after. But it's not to be. Sarah saw the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abraham playing. She said to Abraham, cast out that slave woman and her son, for the son of that slave shall not share the inheritance with my son Isaac. And one of the things that my father spoke about so often in the Bible is that Genesis teaches us the scarcity principle. There's just not enough. Blessings only given to one. What, what, it, life seems to always be a zero-sum game. And monotheism, instead of creating a world of win-win, creates a zero-sum game universe. So I could have learned this when I was seven or eight and came home and my father would say, said to me, Daniil, what did you learn in school today? And my answer was, or could have been, Daniil, Abba, I learned the story of the birth of Isaac. And he would have asked to me, oh, that's a nice story. What else happened in the story? And I said, oh, and Sarah was feeling a little, you know, that people were laughing at her. What else happened in the story? Oh, and then Sarah said that Yishmael and Hagar should leave. And probably, as a seven or eight-year-old, that would have been as far as I understood the story. And then my father would have asked me, and he asked me this question. I just didn't know it was on this. Daniil, why do you think Sarah told Abraham to kick out Yishmael. And why do you think, in two verses down, God says to, Ab to Abraham, all that Sarah says to you, listen to her. Why do you think it was okay to kick out Hagar and Yishmael? I then answered my father as follows, and this I remember answering. I said, 
Abba, Rashi says. Now what does Rashi say? Let's look, turn to Rashi. The 10th century Jewish commentator who writes commentary, which writes on all of Torah, 10th, 11th century, lives in Provence. He says on source two, it says beforehand that Sarah saw the son of, she saw him playing. She saw the son of whom Hagar the Egyptian had born, she saw him playing. Playing in Hebrew is mitzachik. He was playing, literally meaning laughing. What do children do? Laugh. He's a little kid. He was laughing. Rashi says, what does laughing really mean? Making merry, the Hebrew mitzachik, that's an expression of idolatry, as it says, and they rose up to make merry. Another explanation Oh, this is, an ex this is an expression of illicit sexual relations, as it says, to mock. Another explanation is it's an expression of murder, as it says, that the boys go up, get up now and sport before us. Why was Yishmael kicked out of Abraham's house? Why did Sarah say, this child will not inherit with my son? Because who is Yishmael? He is a murderous, adulterous, thieving, idolatrous three-year-old. Why? To my father's question, Daniel, why was Yishmael kicked out? Daniel, what do you think about Yishmael being kicked out? My answer was, Rashi says that Ishmael was an idolater, adulterous murderer. And then my father said a few words which changed my life and which I remember him telling me to this day. My father then said to me, when I said, Abba, Rashi says, my father said to me, Daniel, I didn't ask you what Rashi said. I ask you what you think. And with here, one of the core principles of my father's teaching of Torah were established and taught to me at a very, very early age. To be a committed Jew not only does not preclude the possibility, but is in fact built on the possibility that you bring to the table what you think. And that there is no authority, no authority. There is no Rashi. You have to learn Rashi. But the answer to what you think is never provided by anyone. Anyone. When I ask you what you think, your sole responsibility is to do one thing and one thing only. And that is to think. It's not your job to listen. It's not your job to follow. And nobody, nobody has authority over your mind. Now that creates profound problems when you're in orthodoxy. Um, it's kind of complicated. And my father was always a complicated orthodox man. Because what does it mean to grow up, to live, and to raise your children within an orthodox system in which the foundational principle of your responsibility is, what do you think? That's it. And you have to answer, and not only do you have to answer, Judaism has to answer to you. Has to answer to you. Little did I know that 20 something years later, this would be one of the foundational ideas of his covenantal anthropology in his book, A Living Covenant. What does it mean to stand with God as a covenantal partner and to not be subsumed or consumed by God's authority and by God's word? And that to be a covenantal partner means to stand up and to say what you think. And little did I know 
that really the last book he wrote, the other book, was a collection of essays. The last book he writes, The God Who Hates Lies, is founded on the principle. I said it's loud. The principle that he taught me when I was eight years old. Eight years old. Same principle. That's what the God who hates lies is. It's my father standing up and saying, I'm not going to hide anymore. I'm not going to fuddle and fizzle and say, oops, maybe not. I'm going to stand up straight and I'm going to talk. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to talk publicly. Guess what? What I think. And that when you address a tradition and when you come to a tradition, you come as you. And the tradition only becomes alive to the extent that you come as you. And a Jewish life and a committed Jewish life is not about you disappearing. The gift of covenantal Judaism is that you're in the room. And if you're in the room, and if God turns to you and talks to you, then let me be in the room. Daniil, don't tell me what Rashi said. I don't want to know what Rashi said. Afterwards, you'll tell me what Rashi said. But what Rashi said is only an answer to one question. And that is, what did Rashi say? That's not an answer to what you think. And that when you walk through this tradition, you learn, and you walk, and you listen. But you're always present in the room. Always. And that that's what's what it means to love God and to love Torah. To demand of Torah, to demand of it, that it speak to you. To expect that it meets your questions and that it meets your answers. And that it makes room to them, for them. It is a religious life in which the primary authority in your life is your mind. Primary authority in your life. It's the Abraham of Genesis who has the chutzpah to stand up in chapter 18, and he loved this one more than any. The, the little pishy man who has the chutzpah to turn to God and to say, Chalila lacha, it's forbidden for you. It's a profanation for you to do such a thing. Will the judge of the whole earth not deal justly? And when I was eight, my father started to train me to act like Abraham in Zdom in Genesis 18. And anything less was second rate. Anything less, he had no respect for. He didn't care if you agreed with him. It didn't interest him. Truth is, it did. <laughs> he liked it. Everybody likes it. But like, that was his Yetzirah, and he knew it. <laughs> I wonder, but it's not, he just want, are you there? And the people who he studied with throughout the years were people who were present. He wanted to know if you were present in the room. So the first lesson was, I didn't ask you what Rashi said, I asked you what you think. And that's foundation number one of my father's covenantal anthropology and probably the most important dimension of his religious philosophy. That also which made him beloved and hated at the same time. Beloved and hated at the same time. Because on the one hand, it's empowering, and for some, it's anarchic. It's frightening. What's going to happen if we allow that conversation? Principle number one. The second principle happened when I made Aliyah. And we made Aliyah in the middle of the year, and I went to my father always, the thing that was very critical was that I get a very serious Jewish education. And so I went to a yeshiva where we studied from 6.30 in the morning till 8 o'clock at night. And all the, student, all the teachers at the time um, came from the ultra-Orthodox community. The religious Zionist community had yet to produce its generation of teachers. And this was a school which wanted to make sure that we knew, and we studied Talmud seven hours a day, in high school. 
and Bible was part of secular subjects. And since the day was very, very long, since the day was very long, sometimes like as the, if the teacher saw us getting a little tired, and it's, you have to realize, boys, it's a very long day, sitting, and st it's, it's really quite remarkable. Um, so what they would do is we would have sometimes like a soft hour, or like a few minutes, where the teacher would say, he'd see the students not paying as careful attention, so he would say to us, you know, I want to talk to you about something. And in Hebrew, they're called sichot musar. Um, I don't know how to translate them in English. Um, Bernie, you have a word, try, it's like a musterspiel. <laughs> Ethical inspiring something, it's like something to do with your, how you should live. And I remember this teacher, I remember him, very cute man. His name was Rabbi Asher Shapira, a redhead Haredi man, very round face. And we, I had just made Aliyah, and he comes to us and he says, boys, you are B'nai Torah. You are the sons of Torah. And it is forbidden for you to serve in the army. Because serve in the army. Because students of Torah serve the Jewish people through their study. Someone else will go to the army. You're going to serve the Jewish people through Torah, and you're going to protect them even more. Now, this was a religious Zionist school in which everybody went to the army, but its teachers were ultra-Orthodox, and he had taken it as a mission to try to save a few of us for the world of Torah. Now, I had just made Aliyah, and I was four foot ten in grade nine, I weighed approximately, uh, I think it was 47 pounds. You know, I, I, was, I was like this. Some of you, I don't know if there's anybody, Al, I don't think, yeah. Doug's not here this year. He would attest that that is truly my, was truly my size. I was like this little pish thing. Um, and when I made Aliyah, I got so excited. Because in Israel, if you were a boy, you were a future soldier. Now, you know what it's like? for 47 pound, four foot 10, 14 year old, <laughs> to all of a sudden think that you're potentially a man? <laughs> it's like, cause you're like, it's whatever. But you're not that, you are what? You're a future soldier. The Jewish people are gonna be, you're, are gonna, you're, you're the protector of the Jewish people. And you don't have a muscle, but now you're, you're you're vicariously, I already knew within three months the unit I wanted to be in, the gun I wanted to have, and it's like, all of a sudden, it's like, I'm maxing those, those four foot 10, I was ma it's like, I wasn't slouching the slightest. I was like, I'm a future man. And I'm going to protect, I'm gonna be part of the new generation of Jews who are gonna protect their family. Mommy? I got you. <laughs> got you, mommy. I got you. I'll, I, I'll be, I'm, you can count on me. I'm there. And all of a sudden, my teacher turns to me and says, I don't want you there. I want you to study in yeshiva. And I was very, very upset. Now, one of the things that my father did is everybody in the yeshiva slept. They dormed. And it was one of the ways of ensuring that you're not influenced by people from the outside. <laughs> I was the only one in the whole yeshiva who slept at home. My father wasn't allowed, about to allow anybody to have control over the mind that was supposed to be independent and free. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, um, I would travel back and forth early from Amik Rafaim. We, we lived 150 yards from here and traveled all the way across town to Bait Fagan every morning and every, I leave I think like at six and come home at nine. And um, I came home that night and I said, Abba, and we were really Zionists. We were, my mother was the real Zionist in the family and being a part of this country, serving the country. And I, my teacher says we shouldn't serve in the army. What should I do? And I remember that night, my father says, Daniil, I want to teach you something. 
And what he taught me was source four. He taught me this page. A page that later on I discovered was a, was a good answer for this, but a much bigger answer for a general philosophy of Judaism that defined my father's Zionism and, and as you'll see in a moment, much, very, really much of what he thought. The Lord spoke unto Moses, and any of you who are here more than one year um, will have studied this text at some time or another in the Institute. But I want to repeat it now as, a, as one of the core foundations of my father's Torah. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, go get thee down. God says to Moses, when the Jewish people are sinning with the golden calf, go down. Leave Mount Sinai. There's no reason for you to be here. The people are sinning. And the rabbis ask, what happened? What is meant by go get thee down? What did, why did God tell Moshe to go? So the people are sinning. Why does that mean that Moshe has to leave our Sinai? God, you have a Torah to give. Finish giving your Torah, Moshe will then go down. One of the reasons for giving the Torah is because Jewish people sin all the time. God's biggest problem in the Bible is how to live with mediocre people. God thought that God was going to create people in God's image and everything was going to be great. <laughs> what a joke. Either God had no proper assessment of who God was, or something didn't work exactly the way it should have happened. The minute God's image got mingled with something else, it just didn't come out that way. It came out crap. Crap. And in Genesis 18, God says, this stinks. I'm never again going to do another flood, not because I don't want to, but because it's not going to help. The soul of human beings are evil at their core. And I have to learn how to adjust to it. Now, one of the key ways that God learns how to adjust to this is precisely Torah. In Genesis 1, God didn't think God had to give it Torah because human beings are creating the image of God. You're fine. It's inside you. You don't need instructions. I gave you a little, your mini-me's. Mini-me's are going to come out just like me. Life's fine. But now, God says, it's, the mini-me's aren't like me. Or maybe I'm not like me either. I have to give them a Torah. So what if they're sitting? That's why you're giving them a Torah. So why is God saying, go down? And the rabbis introduce an idea, which I remember that night my father teaching me. Um, what is meant by, go get thee down? Rabbi Ezra said, the Holy One, blessed be he, said to Moses, Moses, descend from thy greatness. Have I at all given to thee greatness, save for the sake of Israel? And now Israel have sinned, then why do I want thee? Descend from thy greatness. My father said to me, there is no, I remember him saying, it, there is no study of Torah that's disconnected from the Jewish people. The yeshiva is on a mountain. And if the people underneath that mountain aren't listening, aren't connected, God says, descend from thy greatness. If they're not with us, what interest do I have in you? And his vision of the Haredi world was of a group of people whose Torah was not in the service of the Jewish people. Oh, there was an argument that it was that it's the, it's, the, it's the Lamed Vavnik theory, the 36 righteous people, will be the righteous people on whom the world will stand. My father said, that's not the way Torah works. If what you're saying is not, what the pe it's not where people are, if it serves yourself, if, it's, if you're creating your own private conversation with God, you're creating an exclusive Jewish club, go down from the mountain, there is no Torah, leave. Leave. Now, one of the things my father didn't tell me was that what he teaches me, I shouldn't necessarily go back to school and tell. <laughs> See, I learned that the next day. <laughs> and I went back. <laughs> and 
the floor if I raised my hand. <laughs> and I didn't realize, I, thank God I grew up in Montreal where they actually taught us Ivrit be Ivrit. So I was able to speak Hebrew. I, I couldn't read at the pace, but I could actually communicate quite quickly as a new immigrant. And I spoke, I said, um, Rebbe, because that's what you're supposed to, or Harav in Hebrew. Yeah, you never call them by Harav. Um, I just wanted to talk to you about what you spoke about yesterday. My father said, uh, well, it was an interesting year afterwards, but, <laughs> but as we all know, the difficult experiences are what um, makes us. So I, I, I learned. Um, but uh, it, was even, it didn't just relate to the service of the army. That's just one feature of it. This is a general approach to Torah. That your Torah is embedded in the midst of a people that there is no private Jewish language. There is no place for individual redemption. There is no place for you, even though he says, Daniel, I didn't ask you what Rashi said, I wanna know what you think. I want you to know that what you think is not simply about finding meaning for yourself. You as a Jew, commitment to Torah means commitment to a people and to bringing that Torah to a people. You're never a Jew alone. And that the purpose of what you know and the purpose of what you've learned has to be not just to enrich your religious life, but it has to be to affect the way Jews live their lives. Are you going to help shape the way Jews live? Or are you going to build a Judaism in which you're the only one who gets it and no one else does? And Judaism is your private discourse that you somehow preserve from generation to generation. And it's never shared with others. This guided his whole life, and very often he was depressed by it. Because it's not easy serving the Jewish people, because remember, Jewish people aren't that great. And as a rabbi, I remember every single Shabbos every single Shabbos. He would spend the whole week working on his sermon. That was his service. To, it was like he would study, his whole week was to, was to, give, was to give over a Torah that, would insp that, that Jews would go home and somehow, and he always felt like after his speech, people should get up and Maybe he should have been in a, in, a, in a Baptist church, but it was like that they should get up and say, Hallelujah, my life has changed. And every time after his sermon, they still went down to Kiddush. It would depress him. Like, like how could you go to Kiddush? Like, aren't, don't you want to talk about it further? Like, why go down to Kiddush? And there was always one man, and because it's being filmed, I won't mention his name, who would sit there in the front row and my father would, see for him his sermon was his shlichut. This was the yeshiva boy who could have stayed in yeshiva. Oh, no, I, to teach Torah to people, this is what, this is what he was about. I have, to, I have to talk to you because it's like, my father was like literally physically shaking you through his search speeches. I'm shaking you. And this man, And every week, my father would go up to him, every single week. So Harry, what did you think? <laughs> and he'd say, it's okay, Rabbi. <laughs> or, I don't agree with you, Rabbi. And for the first hour of every single lunch of Shabbat, my father was depressed. For the first hour of every Shabbos meal. Because it's like, it's not my Torah. It's like, I, I, and it, he, part of his problem was that he needed to get everybody. <laughs> it was like, it was, it was, if that's why, he, if there was one person until he finally learned the art of, of, uh, of asking people, what did you think? It was great, right? <laughs> who heard, who, who was here was ever asked that by him? He didn't want to wait for the answer. He got gave, it was great, right? And then you had no choice, great. It was like he, because he, because the other, because he couldn't have, I need, there, I'm, I have a responsibility to you. 
I have responsibility to you. People like myself or Bernie, who lived with him so many, it's like, we're just responsible. Because if, if you're just sitting and writing something, God, it's, God says, it's, you're not, you're not, that's not what this is about. To create a concept of, 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 of unlimited responsibility to the Jewish people. Unlimited responsibility. And unlimited expectation was what my father was about. But this idea didn't just lead to a commitment to, to, to serve. This was also one of the deepest foundations of his religious pluralism. Because if Torah is not about you, but it's about the Jewish people, it's like, I have to, there's different types of Jews. And how do I create a place where different Jews could come? My father was filled with the search for his own truth all the time, but was all the time looking at where Jews were and feeling obligated to teach a Torah that they could hear. And so at the age of 14, he taught me that there was a different vision of Torah and that indeed I could still fantasize about the gun that I would get eventually if and when I would grow. But he taught me that, that God says, God says, now that the people have sinned, what need do I have of you? The third lesson he taught me was when I was 19. Um, I, at the time, was in a yeshiva called Haaretzion in the Gush. And that's a yeshiva at Hezder. Anybody in the religious Zionist community, there was sort of a, there was a path you took after the Yom Kippur War. The Yom Kippur War, they want this group of soldiers did very well. They loved soldiers in this group, in this unit called Hezder, where we divided our time between army and yeshiva studies. And this was the religious Zionist community. And my father had just made Aliyah in 71, and people had, the first few years, he was teaching in the overseas department at Rothman. And then slowly he began to teach in Hebrew, and students started to come and to flock, and people began to hear about him. And in the yeshiva, Somebody invited him to come give a class. Now, the yeshiva was run at the time, and I won't mention names, by someone who was his chevruta and who was also my babysitter. And this man who used to study with my father at chevruta in Yeshiva University, many, many in the 50s. And uh, when they heard that my father was going to come and teach, they forbade it. That he's not allowed to come teach in, this, in, our, in our yeshiva. But anytime someone tries to control something, the market forces will always win. Will always win. And so a group of students found a building, and, in yeshiva, and the minute the heads of the yeshiva said, you're not allowed to listen to this person, everybody came. It was like, this is like, <laughs> in yeshiva, you're really wicked. <laughs> when you go hear an idea that you're not supposed to. Like, oh, we, like it just, we were fine like for like a whole year, people got all their Yitzhahara out because we heard a forbidden Torah. Anyway, we were really wicked that night. Um, and people came to hear my father teach. And it was in December, and it was right before Hanukkah. And um, he taught the following page. Um, which he loved, loved, on source six. What is the reason for Hanukkah? Now, the first thing my father taught when he says, what's the reason for Hanukkah? This is a crazy question. What do you mean, what's the reason for Hanukkah? My Hanukkah. These are rabbis who are living probably in the year 130, 140, Hanukkah is ostensibly took place 161 before the Common Era. You're talking 300 years the Jewish people are keeping Hanukkah, and now you're asking, what's Hanukkah? <laughs> like, what do you think you've been... For 300 years, what are you doing? One of the things my father taught us, when the rabbis ask, what's Hanukkah? Guess what they're about to do? Change the meaning of Hanukkah. 
The only thing they're not asking is what's Hanukkah, because everybody knows what's Hanukkah. So the purpose of asking what's Hanukkah is to actually tell you what you think Hanukkah is, is not what Hanukkah really is. They were right not to let my father be in the room in the yeshiva. What's Hanukkah? Because if religion is always about everything being the same, and if Moshe Rabbeinu did in fact dress like a 17th century Polish nobleman as he was walking through the desert, then, then, then everything needs to be the same and it's too dangerous to ask, what's Hanukkah? They're changing something. What's going on here? For our rabbis taught, on the 25th of Kislev commence the days of Hanukkah, which are eight, on which a lamentation for the dead and fasts are forbi fasting are forbidden. It's a holiday. And as a holiday, certain practices are forbidden. For when the Greeks entered the temple, they defiled all the oils therein. And when the Hasmonean dynasty prevailed against and defeated them, they made search and found only one cruise of oil which lay within, with the seal of the high priest, but which contained sufficient for one day's lighting only. Yet a miracle was wrought therein, and they lit the lamp therewith for eight days. The following year, these days were appointed a festival with the recital of Hallel and Thanksgiving. Now, with this idea, the rabbis are moving the idea of Hanukkah away from the victory of the Hasmoneans over the Assyrians. The rabbis are saying that what we're celebrating in Hanukkah is not the military victory. We're celebrating the holiday of lights. It's a new idea. This little, this little candle. Now, it's a real stretch because it's kind of a silly holiday. So, you fought for two years and you come into the temple and you only find one little thing of oil. So wait a week. It's like the thing, so okay, so clean up some more. You know, pray a little bit more. Do something else, you know, call people back next week. It's like... This is, it's not like, you know, oh my God, Hanukkah, wow, you know, this great miracle, it lasted for eight days. It's like, what did I, just, oh, you could have, you waited, you wait another week. Like, what's the big deal? But the rabbis wanted to move. They didn't want the military victory of the Hasmoneans. Because the Hasmoneans became a people who stood for Hellenization and did not reflect the type of values that they wanted to represent and that they wanted to promulgate amongst the people. So they move it away from the Hasmoneans and create this new holiday called the Holiday of Lights. Which, by the way, plays much better opposite Christmas. So thank God, could you imagine? Like, it just wouldn't have worked. Now the Holiday of Lights is like a much sweeter, nicer holiday. You know, it's like, it, it's, 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 the truth is, is that in, 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 in 130, they had a very strong modern consciousness and created for us a holiday, which is very, very beautiful. Imagine if like, you know, here is Christmas brotherly love and our holiday is, yeah, we won, we're macho. It's like, it just, it like, it, it wouldn't, it, like this, this would not have done good for the Jewish people in, uh, in and, and made, you know, holiday season. Um, but my father, he turned to all the students and he asked them a question that nobody ever thought about. He asked them and he said, what's the miracle? What's the miracle? The miracle is that this oil, which should have lasted for one day, lasted for eight days. And that's why we celebrate Hanukkah for eight days. So my father turned, and I remember, because it was so shocking. You know, in yeshiva world, one of the best things you could do is ask a question that nobody thought of. It's not the answer. It's like, if you could ask a question, that's, you thought, that's your mind. He said, why eight? How many days was the miracle? Seven. There was enough for one day. The miracle only started, so what are we celebrating on the first day of Hanukkah? What's the miracle? And my father turned to the group and I remember him saying, the miracle of the first day of Hanukkah is the fact that the people who, even though they had only one, whatever this was, what's it called? A, uh, a cruise of oil. Even though they had one cruise of oil, they had the courage to light it even though they didn't know what would happen the next day. They had no idea. To be a Jew 
the holiday of what we're celebrating on Hanukkah, it's not just the miracle that God kept this lighting. The miracle was that we had the courage to start even when we didn't know what was going to happen tomorrow. That we had the courage to light a candle in the midst of uncertainty. That we didn't need messianic certainty. That we didn't need to know what the outcome was going to be. That we as Jews knew how to start, and if we had one day, we were going to start with one day. That's the first miracle of Hanukkah. That we don't wait for everything to be perfect. That we don't wait for everything to be lined up. For my father, that was the essence of his Zionism. He didn't need to love Israel because Israel was perfect. And he didn't need to love Israel because it was going to lead to some messianic conclusion where everything was going to be fine. Israel was the, was the decision of the Jewish people to light a candle and let's see, let it roll. Where is it going to go? Is it going to be good? Is it going to be bad? We don't know. We're going to have the courage to start. And all the naysayers of the world are going to say, no, this is the wrong time. This is not the right time. For my father in his life, there was never this notion of the wrong time. If it had to be done, you did it. What would happen? Where would it go? I remember they were in a fire, my parents, in 1968 in the Laurentians. And uh, um, it was the first vacation they ever took without the kids. They had never taken a vacation without us. Um, we were a very, very close, intense family. The first time they went away, they went away for a weekend without us. And the hotel caught fire. <laughs> I'm alive. You're laughing. Thank you. <laughs> um, it would not. My father lets my mother down with a sheet, and she, she breaks her ankle. And my father, like the Jews in Hanukkah, jumps out the window. He had no idea. Like, like, he just jumped out the window. It's like, that's it. And he, he ended up falling on his back, breaking th three vertebrae. And he had a, it, was, uh, it was very complicated. But it was like, but like that leap, that's Duvi. That's the way Duvi built this campus. That's the way Duvi started the institute. That's the way Duvi made Aliyah. He didn't have anything. It's like, it's just, if something needs to be done, just do it. You do it, you start. That, it's, 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 it's an, an unbelievable optimism and a willingness to push and to work in an incomplete universe. And that you want to know something? If you, you know who all of us are here today? We're the inheritors of people who had the courage to light a candle. Not one of us would be here if, we, if our parents and grandparents and great parents didn't act this way. Because we are a people with a history that doesn't make sense. Just doesn't make sense. We are a people who always had only one candle. It's all we had. And we could have checked out. And we could have said, I'm not, I'm not, this doesn't make, we lit a candle. And sometimes it lasted for eight days, and sometimes it didn't. And then we had to learn how to live in darkness. And in another text similar to this, my father used to teach, why is it the angels turn to God and say to God, you're supposed to be a God of justice. This is, why are you so partial to Jews? It's like, this is a very funny, like these are, you know, we're being killed by Islam, by killed by Christians, but in the page of Talmud, we create this mythic universe as if God's partial to us. God loves us. Great. Okay. God, the angel is saying to God, you're not being fair. You're just so nice to Jews. And God says to the Jew, God says to the angels, I commanded the Jews that under Jewish law, va'achalta, v'savata, uve'rachta. You remember him teaching it? When you eat, and after you eat, you're full, then you say thanks. And if you're not full under Jewish law, you're not supposed to give thanks. There's no birkat amazon if you're still hungry. You don't have to say, baro. you don't need the whole thing. If you don't like the meal, get up and say, I, don't have to, I only have to give thanks on a meal for which I'm full. And God says, I commanded them to give thanks when they're full. 
And when they eat the equivalent of an olive or an egg, they give thanks to me. How can I not be partial to such a people, God says. We start and light when there's just one little bit of oil. And not only do we do that, we even give thanks at that moment. And at that moment, life is good. And tomorrow will come. And we'll find another candle. And we'll manage. And everyone is here because that's what your ancestors did. Because if they didn't do that, they would have checked out. And it's that spirit that built this country. And it's that spirit that my father was captured by. And he couldn't imagine living in any other place in the world. To live with people who are willing to light a candle. And so now we could criticize and what's not right and what is right. Just don't, it's not about whether Israel's right or wrong. It's about starting to look at that candle and to build something. Start your journey. That which was his Zionism is also what started this institute. This institute is filled with young people who are now actually not so young. Who when they were young, my father turned to them and put his hand over their shoulder and said, I believe in you. And they looked to the left and said, who are you believing in? Yeah. I, don't, I have my BA, I only have my MA. I don't, if I says, I'm going to invest in you. Come. You come learn. You grow. You're going to be, and he would say that, you're going to be the next Moshe Rabbeinu. You're going to be the next Maimonides. I'll invest in you. And there's a whole generation of people who began to believe in themselves because my father believed in them. This ability to be optimistic, this ability to begin in an incomplete world, this notion that if a light has to be lit, I will light it even if I don't know where it's going to go, guided his life, guided everything that he did, and then ultimately as well, um, guided his philosophy and the way he taught me and his children and all of his students. And so when you, um, this week we're gonna, we're gonna go deal in depth with his various writings, with the various philosophical approaches and readings that he had, theories of interpretation and prayer and pluralism and the way he read Maimonides and his Zionism. And but at these three moments, as I continued to walk with him throughout his life, um, these three moments just kept on coming. They weren't just things that he taught me when I was 8, 14, and 19. These were, this is who Dovi was. This is who he was. He was a man to the last day of his life, demanded of God and Judaism that it should make sense to him demanded of everybody around them that all of their Torah be in the service of the Jewish people. And that there is no, your goal as a religious person is not to get closer to God for your own personal um, enlightenment, but that the goal of your Torah is to be a light and to serve others. And a person who looked at the world and never saw the fact that didn't make sense. Never saw the fact that there wasn't enough candles and we should wait. You start. You believe. You believe in people. You believe in Israel. You believe in the possibility of change. Unbelievable optimism. He had a great life. He also suffered tremendously. Because very often, the light only lasts for a day. Sometimes, you know, Hanukkahs happen only in the past. <laughs> very often, the light only lasts for a day. And the student, after hearing the lecture, goes to the Kiddush and forgets. But a person who walked through life, never, ever giving up, ever, is a person who provided not just a philosophy of Judaism, but a model of how to live a Jewish life 
and how to build the Jewish life in the modern world and how to build for yourself a place, a place of integrity, a place of responsibility, and a place of hope. Those are the foundations of my father's Torah. Hi, I'm really happy. And uh, I said this, you know, at the funeral, he would have loved his funeral. And he would have loved being here today. He would have been absolutely thrilled, absolutely thrilled um, that, his, that he has a living covenant and that his ideas of how to keep Judaism alive are still alive and that his Torah is being taken seriously and that it's not on the mountain, that it's being given to the people. And it's really an honor and a privilege and a joy to welcome you to this seminar, to welcome you to the Institute, and to welcome you to um, helping fulfilling, to help, helping to fulfill my father's dream that his Torah will be alive and that indeed will be a living covenant. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful week of study here. Um, I hope you challenge his Torah. No reverence is required. And you'll see the teachers because they're all his students, are profoundly irreverent the way he would want us to be. You, it's, you, know, you can't be reverent to your, to your irreverent Rebbe. Um, no one's asking you to agree. All we're asking of you is to learn, is to think. And on the basis of engaging this man's thinking, think about who you are as a Jew. What are the things and what are the foundations that are gonna keep you Jewish? These are the three things that my father taught me. And because of them, I am who I am today. Your challenge is to find those things that are not only what are keeping you Jewish today, but are gonna keep you and your children Jewish tomorrow. And in, so, and in so doing, are giving the utmost, utmost respect and honor to my father. Welcome and thank you. And I think now, um, please come for supper.